Wonderful. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, Dr. Lawler asked me to to come back and, and chat with you all again about kind of the, the current variant situation for SARS-CoV-2. Um, and uh, yeah, happy, happy to do so and, and chat and um, provide you with the latest update, which is uh, nothing terribly interesting in my opinion. Um, that's not to say it's not important. Not, there, there hasn't been any, you know, drastic changes, I think, to the variant landscape. Um, okay, so I think it's always worth starting uh, starting these talks. If we're looking at SARS-CoV-2 variants, we should see what's happening with our epi curves. Uh, again, just from the New York Times here, uh, showing cumulative cases uh, in the U.S. over time. So uh, x-axis is time, y-axis is total number of cases, as Dr. Lawler has pointed out many a times on these calls that you know, because of the the you know upkeep of, of or the uptake of the rapid diagnostic at home test um and that still not really being reported in any in any sort of centralized way uh, on top of the fact people just aren't testing nearly as often as they were in uh previous iterations of of this outbreak um you know cumulative cases isn't necessarily the best metric but the things that i think we can look at that are useful that are, are still being uh tallied here Test positivity rate is has is high and has remained high. Um, I think that's going to to be you know something we see kind of perpetually into the future as long as there's still meaningful transmission um, and testing rates overall in the community are low. You should expect to see a high uh, test positivity rate. Uh, but the the two things that you know seem to be hard to escape from uh, you know uh, from a from a surveillance metric are hospitalizations and and deaths. So we can see that. Uh, we did see kind of a this this bump in both hospitalizations here, um, kind of in early late 2022, early 2023, uh, and and kind of a corresponding bump in in deaths, but not quite as high. Uh, and I think that can be attributed to some of the increased transmission we saw both during the holidays and of the XBB 1.15 variant um, that we we talked about uh, you know a few weeks back. Um, but both of those things do appear to be trending in the right direction, and hopefully, you know, we we catch this at a time where you know, as far as seasonality goes, you know, with respiratory viruses, we catch this at, at a time where folks are just spending less time uh, in, in large gatherings indoors, um, we know is a high risk for SARS-CoV-2 transmission uh, and, and, you know, doing some of these gatherings outdoors. So that's that's what, you know, kind of the epi picture currently looks like. Um, obviously, I'm not reporting on the data. Uh, you know, locally, you all are the experts on that. Um, but, you know, I think it's worth thinking about SARS-CoV-2 variants and whether or not there we're going to see continue to see large uh, corresponding increases in in cases. Um, so I've shown I think I've shown this group this figure before. We're up top. We're breaking down um, the proportion of SARS-CoV-2 genome sequence by variants, starting with you know the earliest variant of concern, the alpha variant B117. Um, we we saw that first kind of emerge in in early 2021. Um, but interestingly, that was kind of associated with, so up here is variant proportion down here is uh, uh, total cases in the U.S. over the same time. Um, interestingly, as we saw alpha, the alpha variant increase, uh, we did see total cases decrease, and this was when uh, vaccine uptake was really, really going up in the population. Um, you know, at the time, we thought the alpha variant was moving incredibly fast, uh, and then we saw Delta, you know, effectively push the alpha variant out over a span of, of months. Uh, and we did see as the Delta variant kind of came uh, to, to win the day, uh, we did see a corresponding increase uh, in SARS-CoV-2 cases in the U.S. during that time. But again, nothing like we saw with Omicron. And I think for both of these, it, sh it shows what we what we now come to appreciate that the uh, 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 the vaccines that were rolled out were, were quite effective in uh, gener generating neutralizing antibodies to these specific variants. Uh, and then, as we all know, we saw the selective sweep of Omicron quickly come out, uh, push Delta out of the way, um, and have it, uh, you know, get to 100% of the proportion where it has remained uh, since. And that, that you know, kind of selective sweep of Omicron corresponded to the biggest spike of, of cases that we'd seen uh, in the U.S. to date due to a combination of, of increased transmissibility and uh, decreased, uh, you know, effectiveness of, of these vaccines. So uh, th there's been a lot made about why are we still calling everything that we see now Omicron, um, and there's some phylogenetic explanations for that, as well as uh, kind of the uh, what all got kind of grouped under the umbrella of Om Omicron when it first was detected in uh, Botswana and South Africa. Um, but everything to date has still remained under that umbrella. We have not seen um, other other. Uh, variants emerge that are not some iteration of 
Omicron as we are currently classifying it. So if we look at the SARS-CoV-2 variant proportions in the US, uh, this is again, the CDC now casts, I, I think this group is pretty familiar with looking at things like this uh, by now, but just to orient you here quickly, again, X axis, these bar graphs are at a certain date uh, and the Y uh, axis is the percent of viral lineages among the infected. So uh, there, there's some modeling that goes on, especially in the now cast um, and some adjustments that go on to generate these values. But again, you can think of this as, you know, of all the virus genomes that were generated in the US, you know, during this week, these were the proportions um, as, as determined by the, the Pango lineage nomenclature. So the, the most recent uh, week that we have measured data for um, would be the, the last week in January. So, you know, about three weeks ago. And, you know, kind of what we'd seen XBB15, this recombinant of two BA2 sublineages uh, coming to, to now peak at over 50%. I think that growth has been slower than what we had initially anticipated. Um, it, you know, if you remember early on, this, it was discussed on this call, uh, I was on multiple calls where it was discussed where the now cast was uh, projecting XBB uh, 1.5 to come to be the dominant variant in a matter of you know, a week or two, not you know two months. Um, and as you can see over here in the now cast, so this is the projections up to the current week, it's still not 100% dominant. Um, so I think this is, is kind of a, a one, it's I think a good thing, uh, especially because we haven't seen this this corresponding really big increase in cases. There's absolutely an increase in case associated with this variant, but nothing like we saw with the original Omicron. Um, but what we are seeing is it is kind of steadily pushing everything else out, um, but not kind of sweeping in, in such a drastic way that we'd seen before, which I think, you know, overall, overall is good. Um, so this is now the, the estimates over here with 95% confidence intervals. Um, uh, these were really big, really early on with XBB15. And the reason I think we, we, we saw some of these initial CDC projections of putting, you know, XBB15 at like 5% one week, then like 40% the next week, which would be a huge jump and obviously something we didn't see, um, was because there has been some actual geographical stratification of this variant, which I think is, is fascinating to see because we didn't see that with Omicron or really with Delta. Uh, once Omicron hit everywhere in the US had an Omicron wave in quickly, but with XBB15, uh, it really dominated the Northeast uh, and has taken time to, to make its way elsewhere uh, in the US. Um, I haven't looked at the Nebraska variant proportions yet that's generated by you know, uh, folks at DHHS and MPHL, but I still don't think, uh, you know, XBB uh, is, is at, you know, 100% uh, in, in Nebraska. I know it's, it's differing by, um, by different areas of the U.S., which I think is, is interesting and, and shows that there is a, you know, there is an advantage of this variant compared to others, clearly, as it's, it's coming to, to, to dominate in a matter of months, um, but it's not the same advantage that we've seen with other Omicron variants. So if you look up here, uh, these are the, the estimates of US totals. So 80% for XBB15 uh, as the way this is going, you know, BQ1.1, which was, you know, BQ1.1 and the BQ1s uh, were kind of the dominant variant for a while, and those are steadily decreasing. Um, and then the, the interesting thing that I, I did want to point out here, and I'll talk about this a little bit on this next slide, is the CH1.1 variant. It's about 1.2, estimated to be about 1% in the US. Uh, but this is actually the dominant or a sublineage of this is the now the dominant variant in Australia. Uh, they're seeing a lot of these cases in the UK as well. Uh, so the CH.1.1 variant, this, this alphabet soup of, of Omicron, this is also a recombinant. So it's it's really interesting to see if we look at this globally. So you know, similar, similar approach to this data set here. So this is this is the US. This is what's going on uh, throughout the world, but it's just broken down by country, and there's there's less uh, sublineage breakdown here. So obviously, you know things like alpha, delta, gamma, uh, beta, none of that should be showing up if we're seeing that now. <clears throat> Either something very strange has happened, or we have sequencing errors, um, but you're not seeing this in these graphs. But what you are really seeing is uh, this this uh, um, Omicron BA.2.75, which we'd seen in the U.S. Is still really dominant in places like Australia. It's still high high proportion in other spots of Europe, um, but the BQ ones are still uh, that's this kind of uh, I guess salmon color um, is really kind of the 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 overall uh, you know winner throughout most of Europe. Uh, but then if you come down to the U.S., this this blue bar over here is XBB15, uh, and then and this is again so this is this data is a little bit old. This is January 30th, so you know a few weeks old. 
So this is all measured proportions, not estimates. But this green bar over here, and what they're just broadly classifying as recombinant. So XBB15 and what this recombinant lineage is, is actually CH1.1 and some iteration thereof, which is at, you know, 1% in the U.S., but it's interesting to see that another and specifically a different recombinant of, of Omicron. So again, recomb you know, virus recombination works in a variety of different ways. Uh, but for SARS-CoV-2, what we've seen is, is, you know, theoretically, someone needs to be co-infected with two different distinct lineages of SARS-CoV-2 at this point in time of, of Omicron. Uh, and through, you know, some some strange viral replication machinery event, uh, you know, you get half of one virus and half of the other and they get stuck together somewhere. And so for XBB15, that's two different BA2 sublineages. And I actually believe for CH1.1, uh, that is also two, se again, separate BA2 sublineages of the viruses where, you know, BQ1 and all the, the lineages prior to that were BA5s. Um, so it is moving elsewhere, you know, kind of on the you know, in the evolutionary landscape of SARS-CoV-2, but it is, again, still some version of, of Omicron. But I did think this was interesting to see that the uh, viral recombinants are, are now, you know, at three years into this is, is what is, uh, uh, you know, resulting in, in the most cases. So it, it's, it's, I think, interesting to think about from more of an evolutionary biology standpoint is, you know, how do you you know, variants of concern are concerning because mutations arise in the genome and those mutations have some sort of phenotypic effect, um, whether it be, you know, uh, reduced efficacy of vaccine or previous infection induced immunity, increased transmissibility, increased ability to replicate, what have you. Um, but that's all due to, to mutations occurring. And mutations are one, you know, de novo viral mutations are one really good way to generate genetic diversity. Recombination is another really good way to generate genetic diversity. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to, to, you know, kind of in that same vein to talk about today is thinking about maintaining old lineages as another way to kind of maintain the genetic diversity of SARS-CoV-2 that exists kind of in, you know, in you know, the community, not necessarily the human community. So there was a preprint that just came out that I thought this group might find interesting because I know some of this work is being done in Nebraska. I'm really excited to see some of your all's most recent sampling data. Um, but this group uh, that did some studies in Ohio um, have just put this preprint out on research squares, kind of like MedArchive, um, about accelerated evolution of SARS-CoV-2 in free-ranging white-tailed deer populations. So we've seen, obviously, in Nebraska that uh, I think what they said in this now is 27 states have identified uh, SARS-CoV-2, either uh, PCR positives or uh, seropositivity in white-tailed deer populations. Uh, so this group uh, had a really robust sampling strategy um, from the alpha uh, wave through the delta wave all throughout Ohio and identifying these clusters of SARS-CoV-2 that occur in white-tailed deer. Uh, and this is just showing you kind of the, 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 the lineage proportion that they were detecting. And what, what I thought was interesting from the study was not only were they detecting clearly human to deer spillover events um, as, as the lineage proportions kind of match in the deer population, what they saw in the human population, but they would then isolate these, uh, or they would sequence these viruses and look to see if uh, deer posed, you know, sort of a different selective pressure on on the SARS-CoV-2 variants that they were observing in these populations. Um, and this, you know, I don't think should come as any surprise as, you know, if there's any viral ecologists in the room or really kind of evolutionary biologists as, uh, of, of pathogens, you know, if a virus gets in a human, you know, it has to deal with the human immune system. It might have to deal with things like, you know, uh, Paxlovid, the drugs that, that we use to introduce or uh, uh, to, to clear viruses and has to do with vaccine-induced immunity. That's kind of a different selective pressure than it would find in a, in a deer population, right? So, so humans and deers, you know, evolutionarily speaking, are similar, but they are not the same thing. So what they did was then calculated the substitutions per site per year, which is kind of an uh, you know, evolutionary measure of mutation rates um, uh, at different spots across the SARS-CoV-2 genome. So an ORF1B, ORF1A, spike gene, nucleocapsid gene, envelope gene, all, all those things. And what they found is that there was distinctly different patterns of mutation rates occurring in viruses sampled from deer. So you know the, the lineage of the virus would be similar but once that virus got into a deer population, it would evolve in a different way. 
Uh, and then what, and that's what this, this kind of distribution graph over here is showing you. So substitutions per site per year and the frequency they were observed in the viruses um, in all of these, these different protein coding regions. Uh, and then what they showed over, you know, this is, this is kind of a busy graph, basically it's showing what's called dinucleotide usage. So how often in the genome you find an AC next to an AG or an AT or CG, so on and so forth in human and deer. And what they actually found is that uh, there was uh, an increased propensity of C to T mutations in uh, viruses uh, identified from deer compared to humans. So what is the long-term evolutionary consequences of that? Does that mean it's going to, you know, result in a, a you know, a more, uh, you know, virulent virus or, you know, maybe a less virulent virus? It's, it's hard to tell at the moment. They did do, in the study, they did do some uh, kind of phenotypic characterizations of these viruses, which was also really cool. Um, but to show that the that, that, you know, viruses are getting to the deer population and then evolving in a different way than they would in human populations should lead us to think you know, deer can actually act as another kind of source of evolutionary pressure on SARS-CoV-2. So we have to deal with you know, viruses mutating when it's transmitted from, from humans to humans. We have to deal with viruses recombining in human populations as kind of a novel way to generate genetic diversity. But we really do need to think kind of long and hard about uh, zoonotic reservoirs of SARS-CoV-2 and the fact that they are exerting clearly different selective pressures on this virus than they would if it was just solely a human pathogen. Uh, and then the last thing, uh, so this 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 uh, preprint was relatively new. This came out um, in, I think, late 2022, but I hadn't seen it, and I thought it was worth mentioning to this group. Uh, this Nature Microbiology study uh, showed that there was this really long branch, you know, so basically a lot of mutations occurring in this B.1.641 lineage, which um, I don't think actually fell. Yeah, so it wasn't Delta, it wasn't Omicron. It didn't actually fall in a variant of concern. There had been identified cases in humans, but they found this really large branch of clusters. I don't remember exactly where this was in a white-tailed deer population. Oops. Um, and that they actually found epidemiological evidence of spill back. So the humans clearly infected the deer. The virus evolved to generate kind of a, a long branch. So this, this virus accumulated a bunch of mutations um, and, and probably different mutations than what have accumulated in the human population. Uh, and then they found epidemiological evidence that humans then got reinfected with that virus. Um, and they kind of lay out what uh, what that process could have looked like here. You know, basically the you know human infected deer, deer then infected human, uh, human infected deer or some other mammal, which then infected both human and deer. But uh, really, I think kind of an interesting thing to to bring up to this group as I know that we're we're kind of sampling wildlife populations for the presence of SARS-CoV-2, where if we do get some genome sequences from them, we may expect to see um, some you know, potentially meaningful divergence. Again, there's nothing about, there, there's no phenotypic evidence that this suggests that this virus is somehow worse than the, than the virus is circulating. But again, I, I think kind of as a, as, a, as a one health principle to show that these, these variants can infect wildlife populations and then evolve in different ways and potentially reinfect humans is, you know, another thing that I think we should be uh, kind of considering. Um, you know, when, when we think about the long-term trajectory of this pandemic. So uh, with that, if there's any questions, happy to answer those. Uh, hope you all found that interesting. Just when we all thought there wasn't one more thing to be worried